So to briefly introduce myself, my name is Dan Duffy. I am a husband. Uh, my wife, Stephanie, and I have been married. It will be, oh my goodness, it'll be 20 years in October. Um, I'm a dad. I have a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old. The 17-year-old is Sam. The 15-year-old is Benjamin. Uh, I'm a video producer. I'm a cancer survivor. I'm an author and a blogger and a musician and a fan of all things amazing, no matter if it's um, art or sports or whatever. I absolutely just love things that are are cool and interesting and especially stories. I love telling stories um, and I love other people telling me their stories. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to share the most unbelievable story with you. I do not want you to take any notes. I just want you to listen and I want you to try and picture the scenes um, that I'm going to attempt to paint for you. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to ask you a few questions about this story. And if I've done my job well enough, you will know the answers to some, if not all of them. Um, so I'm going to tell you the story of how my wife and I met John Paul II on our honeymoon. So it was April 28th of 2004. It was two days before we were supposed to leave for Italy on our honeymoon. And my phone rings and it is the priest who married us. And he's calling from Rome. He was actually a friar and he was studying in Rome. So he calls me up and he says, how would you guys like to meet Pope John Paul II? And I almost fell out of my chair. I'm like, this would be amazing. So he said, all you have to do is bring Stephanie's wedding dress. And I said, there's no way on God's green earth that's happening. We are already primarily packed. Um, we do not have the space or the funds to, to bring another suitcase. I mean, this thing is is like wrapped up and it's, you know, it's shrink wrapped and, and there's no way we're, we're going to be able to take her wedding dress. And so he says, well, can you get a white dress? So I called Stephanie and I said, Alaric, who's the name of the priest, has said, we may have a chance to meet Pope John Paul II. We need to find a white dress. So Stephanie immediately calls her mother in Effingham, Illinois, which is about an hour and a half away, and says, mom, I need a white dress. Do we have anything? And Stephanie's mom said, well, we've got your sister's eighth grade confirmation dress. And she said, there's no way that's going to fit. She goes, well, it's all I've got. Let's give it a try. So her mother actually put the dress in her car and brought it to St. Louis and Stephanie tried it on and somehow miraculously it fit. The only problem is the, uh, the armpits in the dress were kind of sewn down. So if she was arrested and reached for the sky, you're going to see all the way to Cleveland. So arms had to be kept down. So the eighth grade, uh, the eighth grade confirmation dress, there it is. But then I thought to myself, my God, a dress is, it's not going to be enough. She's got to have a veil. So I said, Steph, do you, do you still have your veil? And she goes, no, I don't have my veil. Why would I have my veil? It's probably at my mother's house. So we have a place in town called Catholic Supply. And I'm like, I am sure that we could get a veil there. So I went to Catholic Supply and I said, do you have any wedding veils? And they said, no, but we do have second grade first Holy Communion veils. So I looked at one and there's one that you could actually like fork into your hair. So I said, you know what, that's that's going to have to be good enough. So now we've got this confirmation dress and a communion veil, and that's what we're going to bring to Italy. So before we actually fly to Italy, we've got about 10 hours in New York City, which my wife and I imbibed and we went and ate sushi and drank wine and had a great time. And on the walk back to where our bags were at a friend's house, I said, you know, I got to tell you, Italy may not have like a pay less shoe source and you may have to buy like a couple hundred dollar pair of shoes. There's a pay less on Fifth Avenue. Why don't we go there and get you a pair of shoes? Because she had to have white closed toed heels. And so Stephanie goes, you know what? That's not a terrible idea. And right as we're saying that, we look up and see, I kid you not, the only Kmart in downtown Manhattan. And I looked at her and I said, I bet you could find a pair of shoes there. And she said, not if they're over 1099. 
So we walked into Kmart, asked where the shoes were. We went up the escalator and I just happened to walk right to a pair of white closed toed heels. And we picked up the bottom of the shoe, $9.99. So there we are going to Italy with the confirmation dress, the communion veil and $10 shoes. So we get to Venice. Rome is actually going to be the last part of our tour. We get to Venice. Um, we then we go to Tuscany and we visit Florence for the day and we sneak into Pisa for an hour. And we went to the Amalfi Coast, a place called Ravello, and it was beautiful. And then we get to Rome. I drop Stephanie off at the hotel and then I dump the car because you do not want a car in Rome. I get back to the hotel and the priest is in our room and says, we have a problem. Um, apparently when Pope John Paul II, uh, was first, uh, was first ordained or named Pope, if you were married for a year, you could actually have your marriage blessed by the Pope. Well, a lot of people kind of took advantage of that. And there were tons of people that were like forging documents and all sorts of stuff to where it went from a year to six months. And then as he started getting frailer and frailer, it went down to two months, so you had to be married two months or less in order to get your marriage blessed. The problem was we had been married six months ago. Now we did actually bring our uh, our marriage certificate, which, which we had to do. We were told we had to do. And the priest said, okay, you've got a choice. You can do one of two things. One, you can throw yourself uh, upon the mercy of the Swiss guard or two, we can doctor your marriage certificate to make it look like you were married within the last two months. And Stephanie and I looked at each other. We're like, that's like lying to God. We, we absolutely positively can't do that. So he's like, okay, well, good luck. So he handed us the tickets. And the next morning we, uh, we got ready. Stephanie put on the confirmation dress and the communion veil and the $10 shoes. And I put on my suit that I had bought 30 pounds ago, which is now very, very tight. And we took off for the Vatican. The cab let us out. We went and we bought two strands of rosary beads because we had nieces. And uh, and just in case that we were able to actually get these blessed by the Pope, we wanted to have something to give to our nieces. Like, hey, here's some rosary beads blessed by the Pope. So we show the marriage certificate. We show our tickets. We get through the first layer of security and we start that very long walk all the way through St. Peter's Square to get to where the uh, the brides and grooms will actually sit. And this older member of the Swiss Guard looks at our marriage certificate and he goes, no, 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 no. And we're like, oh. like, we were absolutely soul crushed. And then he looked at my wife and I, who were both gingers, and he goes, Ireland? And we said, America? And then he goes, momento. And he walks away and I grab Stephanie's hand and we are literally breaking each other's hands. We are just absolutely praying that they will show mercy on us. Then this really tall drink of water member of the Swiss Guard comes up and you can tell he has the power because the older gentleman deferred to him. And he looked at our marriage certificate. He looked at us and we were a sight and he put his hands together and he said this. And he let us in. So then we're like, oh my God, we we passed. We didn't lie and, and we were let in. So then we went and we sat next to uh, this other couple who had just been married, hopefully within the last two months. And there's all these other couples around us and they're all wearing like Vera Wang and Ralph Lauren and we are not. Um, and so we sit down and we're just sort of waiting. And all of a sudden here come these two guys and they are handing out business cards. And the business cards were to a camera store. And we're like, oh my God, we're gonna get our picture taken with the Pope. And now we're starting to get giddy and we're super excited. And then like 20 minutes later, here comes the Pope and the Pope mobile and it's amazing. And the crowd's going nuts and, and we are just absolutely tingling with excitement. And then we got bored. And the reason why we got bored is when the Pope gives his audience on a Wednesday, 
He does it in five languages. Now, the third language is always English. So we, we get through the first two and then we get through the third. And these are like 20 minutes each. We get to the third and he's given it in English and we can understand everything. And oh my God, listen to the Pope words. They're, they're just amazing. And then he does it in two more languages. And by the time like the, that halfway through the fifth language, you're like, I mean, it's, you cannot help it. But then the fifth language ends and then um, the people start filing out of St. Peter's Square. All these dignitaries who are up kind of on the stage with the Pope begin shaking his hand and everything is cool. And then all of a sudden here come the Swiss guard and they go to take all of the couples who are getting their marriages blessed by the Pope, which is absolutely now, I mean, like we're absolutely tingling again. There's probably about 20 couples ahead of us and we're just slowly but surely going. Um, and the first couple kneels down and they do this, he does this, and then they stand up and they leave and they're like, oh, we're not going to get to touch him. Ah, so, so be it. You know, we get to actually kneel like right in front of the Pope. How cool is that? So then uh, like six more couples go in and then the next couple to go in, they kneel down, they do this, he does this. And then the guy just goes. And so the Pope goes and shakes the guy's hand, shakes the girl's hand. And all is right with the world. So then what happened was three more couples shake hands and then this other couple, and they are very, very, very overwhelmed by all of this going on. And they do this, he does this, and they go to stand up and the Pope goes as if to say, it's okay, I'm a man. I can shake your hand. You can shake mine. I am no better than you are. And it was a really, really, really amazing thing. And then it came time for us. So we quickly wrapped the rosary beads in our hands and, and we knelt down in front of the Pope and I looked down and he had the red leather shoes and they, they were really cool. I'm not going to lie. I'd never, I, I heard about the shoes and I think I'd seen a picture, but there they were right in front of me. So I look up, Stephanie and I do that. He does that. I go to stretch my hand out. He takes my hand. He had the softest hands I've ever felt in my natural born life. He must get manicured every day. I mean, there's not a wrinkle on them. I don't even think there was a fingerprint. It was, they were glassy almost. So I shook his hand. And of course he touched the rosary beads. And then he shook my wife's hand and touched her rosary beads. And we both stood up and we walked out completely and utterly silent. We didn't say a word. And it was one of the most amazing things ever. There was nothing to be said. And an hour later, we celebrated by going to McDonald's. So that is the story of how we met the Pope. Now, I'm a big believer in the two most important things about storytelling is the how and the why. So in that story, the how is, well, I just kind of told you the how, but the why, why were we actually able to do it? Because we were honest, we were earnest, we were devout, and it meant so much to us. The Swiss guard guy didn't have to let us in. He probably has people trying to lie to him all the time. Yet there we were, and we got to shake the Pope's hand. So when telling a story, if someone's interested in hearing your story, how is always the first question or mostly the first question that someone asks, but sometimes it can take a minute to get there. For instance, I can tell you that I used to work in radio, big deal, but then I could go further. I used to work for the number one ranked show in St. Louis, and we ended up getting syndicated to 30 markets. Okay. That's a little bit more interesting, but you may not be interested in hearing how that even happened. But then what if I was to tell you it was my first and only job in radio, I was 21, and I had no experience whatsoever on any major market radio station. Now you're potentially starting to think, okay, how does that even happen? Oh, and by the way, my job didn't even exist when I applied. They created it for me. Now you may be thinking, okay, how in Hades did that happen? I am so glad you asked. So... I was a terrible high school student. Um, in fact, I was so terrible that out of our 
class of 179, I was ranked 178. There are some years, I actually went to summer school, freshman, sophomore, and junior year. I have no idea how I passed senior year, not having to go to summer school. And I'm really not sure how I was able to stay in the school in the first place. So as you can tell, I was not the greatest student in the world. And by not being the greatest student in the world, it meant I wanted nothing to do with going to college. So what I did was I was dating a girl at the time and her mom owned a delivery driver service. And I thought to myself, you know what? I can go make a little money and then figure out what I want to do with my life. And so I did that for about a year and a half, and I made more money than any of the guys I knew going to college. I knew some people who'd been to college at a state school like one semester and gotten a 0, 0.0, and we're doing like community college now. Um, and I was kind of doing better than them, and, and that was fine by me. And so um, life was good. But then it started to nag on me saying, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I really don't want to do this for the rest of my life, but it looked like I didn't really have a whole heck of a lot of options. So one day I just happened to be downtown and I'm getting ready to make a delivery. And it was a beautiful day. Just, I mean, like probably like 75, 80 degrees, light breeze out of the West. Um, I mean, beautiful blue sky, probably late April, early May. And I thought to myself, wow, this is such a really nice day. And I happened to be at a stoplight. And there's a crosswalk right in front of me. And 50 people get the white light for, to go. And so they start walking across the crosswalk. Now, the first thing I noticed was their feet. All of the gentlemen were wearing wingtip shoes. And all of the women at this time, uh, they used to wear heels at the office. But then when they were walking to lunch, they wear these big, thick white socks with white Reeboks. And that's what they'd walk to lunch in. So I looked at their shoes and then I looked at their faces and every one of their faces looked like this. And it was like an epiphany. Like I, I didn't know what I'd just seen, but I knew it actually meant something. I just didn't know what, but I knew, I knew I had to figure out. Um, so I called down the radio and I faked a stomach cramp. I'm like, I'm making one more delivery then I gotta go home. Um, but on the way home, like it actually hit me. What you do for a living, doesn't matter if you're married or single or have 50 kids or no, what you do for a living is what you spend most of your waking life doing. And it made absolutely no sense to me that all of these people chose something that would make them miserable. Like all of them, like to a person. So I thought to myself, well, I don't want that to be me. Like, I've got to figure out what I want to do. So I actually got out a, a pad, a notepad and a piece of paper. And I literally just listed, I mean, we're talking, there were probably at least 150. I listed everything I ever wanted to do. It started with pornography. It ended with the priesthood. Those were the first two to get crossed off. And then I just kept whittling it down and whittling it down and whittling it down and until it hit me. I wanted to work for a radio station and specifically a radio show called Steve and DC. Now, I used to listen to these guys every day. And when I first started listening to them, I couldn't stand them. They were just so, eh, love you, you know, that kind of stuff. But then it became like appointment radio. Like I would literally time my deliveries to where I would pull into a place and I'd wait in the car. And as soon as they'd go to commercial, I would race in, get the signature and race out before they came out of commercial. That's how much I love this show. And so thankfully there was a school in St. Louis called Broadcast Center. And Broadcast Center is basically DJ school. So I went to DJ school and I've been there for eight months and I'm slowly coming up on graduation when the placement director comes in and says, hey, I've got a job for you. And I said, well, that's great. What's the job? And he said, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I said, nope. And he said, all right, fine. I, I, I kind of get that. Nobody takes the first job anyway. So I'll come back, you know, when I find something else. So I'm like, great. Thank you. Two days later, he comes back and he goes, Hey, I got something closer to home for you. And I'm like, okay, what do you have? And he goes, well, I've got Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Well, that's like less than an hour and a half away. I said, okay, that's close to St. Louis. Um, so, you know, what are you thinking? 
And he goes, 10 to 6 overnights board hopping for minimum. The translation for that is 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. overnights board hopping. So I'm just pushing buttons on commercials. I don't even get to read a weather forecast for $4 an hour. And I said, nope. And now he's ticked because now I'm messing with his success of finding a job for every single graduate. So a few days later, when I didn't think he'd kill me, I walked into his office and I said, Tim, his name is Tim. I said, Tim, I would like to tell you where I want to work. And he goes, okay, where do you want to work? And I said, I would like to work for Stephen DC. And he laughed. And I said, no, no, no. Like, I'm not, why, you know, like, what's the problem? And he goes, they're major market. You've never been in radio in your life. And I said, look, I'm not looking for a paying job. I'm just looking for an internship. And then he goes, they've already got two interns. They don't need a third. And at that point, I just kind of nodded my head and I walked out. And like the punk 21-year-old I was, I said, "How?" under my breath, he didn't hear me. I said, how dare you tell me what I can and can't do with my life? So then I did something that today would be almost unheard of. I wrote them a letter in ink and I, I didn't even mail it to them. I dropped it off at their, uh, at the front desk of the radio station and I addressed it to Stephen DC and I put the address and I said, I'm, I just have a letter for them. And I left and this was on a Wednesday by Friday, my phone rings and I'm like, hello, Dan, it's DC. And he had this kind of lisp, So I knew it was him. I'm like, oh my God, like, what are you, why are you calling? And he said, we read your letter. We thought it was really funny. And we'd like to have you in for an interview to possibly be an intern. And you could have knocked me over with a feather. Could not believe it. So I went in there and I had a really fun interview. And we talked all about some stuff and, and yada, yada. And he goes, all right, we'll think about it. So I remember walking out of there and I just went, please. And so uh I get home and an hour later, my phone rings and it's Kim Furlow, our news lady. She said, you got the internship. And I was so thrilled. And she said, you're going to help me get some news and traffic reports together so I can be on the air more. And I'm like, that's great. I would love to do that. I don't have to be on the air. Like, perfect, perfect, perfect. And my first day on the air was Wednesday, March 9th of 1994. And I got there and uh, I never hit the air. All I did was ran around like a chicken with my head cut off doing everything and anything I possibly could from um, getting coffee to like ripping uh, news off the headlines to, to bring them to Kim, to, to doing anything that they wanted. And by the end of the day, I was exhausted and exhilarated at once. And I said, I have absolutely found my life's calling. And at the show after that first day, they're like, Danny, nice job. I'm like, well, thank you very much. And Steve, one of the hosts says, can you do sports? And the reason why he asked me this is because our news lady, while being really good at news, was really bad at sports. Like, for instance, there was a guy named Tony Herkus who played for the St. Louis Blues hockey team. And Herkus is spelled H-R-K-A-C. She actually pronounced his name Tony Harkake. They started getting calls saying, get her off the air, which was really not nice. But sports wasn't her thing. So I'm like, yeah, I think I can do sports. So they're like, go to Broadcast Center, record us a sports cast today and bring it in tomorrow. So I went to Broadcast Center. I recorded a sports cast. I brought it in on that Thursday. I still wasn't on the air. Everything was great, yada, yada, yada. And handed them the tape after the show. And then Friday after the show, Steve comes up to me and says, we heard it. We like it. How'd you like to do sports on the air? And that's how I became the sports caster for five years for Steve and DC. And I had been there for maybe three weeks. And uh, our producer, Courtney, uh, um, she was always left to work like every day by herself. And she was always completely swamped with stuff. So one day I just happened to go in there and I said, um, do you need any help? And she said, uh, sure, uh, we're having an author on in three weeks. Here's the publicist. Can you call and get two books delivered to the guys so they can at least skim them before we have the author on? And I said, absolutely. And so I went and I made the phone call and I asked and I got the books and I came back 90 seconds later and said, okay, what else do you got? And that's how I became the assistant producer of Stephen DC. They had never had an assistant producer. They had never had a sportscaster. 
And I walked my way into it by writing them a letter and being earnest and being honest and basically throwing myself at the mercy of Stephen DC. And it was absolutely amazing. Okay, so you, you noticed what was included in that how story, hopefully without beating you over the head with it. And it's the why. You know, the how is the structure, the why is the meaning. My why in that story was the fear of never living up to my potential. Scratch that. That's something my mother would say. God bless her. My true fear? Settling. I didn't want to settle. So now you got to ask yourself, like, what's your why? Well, your why is your story. Why do you do what you do? And because they go hand in hand, how do you manifest your why? Because let's be honest, people in the end don't buy your product. They buy you. It's an emotional reaction, and an emotional reaction is always so much more meaningful than a financial transaction. For instance, I have had at least, we're talking about haircuts, I've had at least 50 people cut my hair over my entire lifespan, but only one person has done it over the last four years. Her name is Becky, and I smile every time I go in to get a haircut because I know it's going to be an amazing 20-minute conversation. And I know I'm going to feel better about myself when I walk out. She is very, very good at cutting men's hair. But I also know that Becky and her husband had been married for about three years. They didn't take their honeymoon to Hawaii because of COVID and instead took that money and they redid their basement. They have a daughter named Evelyn who's about to turn one. We both love the movie Just Friends with Ryan Reynolds. And she knows how Stephanie and I met. And she knows that Stephanie and I had our first kiss at a lesbian bar, which is a ridiculously ridiculous story um, that I'm not going to share with you right now. She knows where our boys go to school, what interests they have. And she knows that Ben, like I was telling you, is no longer happy walking out of there and he needs to find a place that specializes in curly hair. And she's all for it because he's 15 and this matters. Becky gets it because she's open to getting it. Just like that day in the crosswalk with those 50 people, for some reason, I was open enough to get it and even more open enough to realize that what they were doing made no sense. And this is one of the most important things about being able to tell your story. It's being open to it. I mean, if it's just you with no interaction with another human, it's about imbibing the little things, the sounds, the sights, the feelings, both physical and emotional. Like that day, I remember that it was a really nice day. The weather was great. The wind was gorgeous. The sky was blue and their faces. Like I had both a physical and an emotional reaction to that. And then if other people are involved, it's about the overused but underutilized concept of reading the room. And if you read it properly, Hey, Dan, can you hear us? He's still on. <laughs> Alex, can you make a note for the 28 minute mark where you're going to need to cut this? <coughs> <coughs> Wayne, do you have his phone number? Yes, I can call him real quick. <coughs> nope. Nope. He's got a phone number. He's probably in a bounce back off. He left the room. Cody, why don't you fill in a little bit about how we met Dan? <coughs> yeah, you met Dan first. Dan with the key. There you go. Is he back? No, I was just sharing oh. this picture. It's a pretty dress. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Okay, no problem. You know what I mean? We're ready when you are. You can see all the couples lined Good up. Good job, buddy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I took Dan to Haiti with me. We were filming a documentary of it. You know, went with Todd Newton, which is the Price is Right guy, and Sammy, the guy that had a stroke, went because I built a, uh, I, I built, but I bought a, uh, 
community so that we include your roof on. And as much as I know about roofing, it's just the roof here. So Sammy, we've had to help me do that, the engineer, whatever. And our, we'll show you this after, after we're done if we have time, but our truck broke down. And literally, you, know, you talk about your car breaking down here, you got to call AAA, you got to wait two hours, whatever. Well, we were on the side of the road within 25, 30 minutes. The truck was fixed. Some guy rode his bike there, picked up the park, came back, you know, got everything going. So while we're there, we filmed a um, a uh, storage wars uh, commercial as a, as a joke. We're seeing my friend who had the stroke. So the other week at Sandy's party, we played that show them. We had a big fundraiser because it's not doing well. And uh, yeah. so yeah, just Dan is a great guy. Right? Dan, <laughs> Dan, I was just lying about you taking up some time about going to you. <laughs> well, thanks for that. <clears throat> so, were you telling the story about storage wars? I just <laughs> was. Well, it just was better. <laughs> yep. That's what I. That's what I figured. It's a good go-to. <laughs> All right. So, um, I can continue if you like. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I think I left off with, with um, Becky actually understanding about what's going on with, um, with Benny. And the reason why is because she gets it. She's open to getting it, just like that day in the crosswalk when those uh, 50 people were there. I actually was open enough to get what was going on. And that's one of the most important things about being able to tell your story. It, it's being open to it. I mean, if it's if it's just you with no interaction with another human, it's about imbibing the little things like the sights, the sounds, and the feelings like a sunny day, a blue sky, a nice breeze at a crosswalk. Now, if other people are involved, it's about the overused and underutilized concept of reading the room. And if you read it properly, those interactions can actually have a pretty profound impact on your life. Now, one such interaction by your fearless leader, Mr. Elsie, totally changed how I engage with people. Um, there's a story that Wayne was actually working at a shoe store and a bunch of women came in and one of the women actually had her foot size wasn't necessarily what you'd call delicate. In fact, I think it was like around like a size 12, if I'm not mistaken, um, and she looked very uncomfortable and she was slightly embarrassed. And Wayne, by reading the room, actually picked up on this. And so what happened was when he measured everybody's feet and he actually got the, the correct measurement on her feet, he went and he brought back uh, all the shoes for the ladies. Um, and in the woman that had the size 12 feet, he had them in a size eight box. And he goes, oh, you're a size eight. Well, here you go, because that was a much more palatable number for her to, to actually accept around her friends. And, and it made a difference. And I got to tell you, I mean, I may not have gotten perfect accuracy on the story. She may have been a size 14. The shoe box was a size seven, but the basics and the intent are all the same. And honestly, it changed the way I deal with everybody that I meet. I mean, when something amazing like that happens to you or maybe because of you, you have to figure out, I'm so glad he shared this story because you have to figure out a way to share it. And it's not for an ego stroke at all. Wayne didn't share the story to say, oh, look what I did. He did it to affect change in others. It totally affected a change in me. I mean, it taught me the importance of reading a room. In fact, whenever I enter a room now, instead of being the quietest person in the room, which I used to be, I now look for the quietest person in the room and I try to include them and make them feel welcome and make them feel less alone. Um, I am going to share a story with you that I have never, ever, I didn't think I was gonna do it, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm going to share a story that I have never, ever shared with anyone because I used to think that sharing something like this would be self-serving. Um, but in all honesty, I think it serves others if they ever find themselves in this situation. So we used to have this thing called the VP Fair. Now it's called Fair St. I don't even know if it's called Fair St. Louis anymore. I don't even know if it exists anymore. But it used to be nicknamed America's Biggest Birthday Bash. And like on July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, everybody would get together 
together uh, on the St. Louis Gateway Arch Grounds. And there'd be like major concerts, like Elton John played one year, the Beach Boys played one year. Um, and like they'd have air shows, they'd have the Harrier and F-14s and F-16s. And it was just absolutely an amazing time. And there would be like 100,000 people down there. And it was really a pretty awesome party. And one of the things that that I did, I used to work down there at this fair. And what we did was we made sure that everybody's radios uh, stayed working. So like we did batteries, we we fixed radios because people had to talk to each other behind the scenes um, just logistically to, to make everything happen. And sometimes because we were right next to Lost and Found, um, you'd actually meet people that you didn't plan on meeting. So I will never forget, this gentleman came up to me and he is absolutely frantic. He's got his daughter with him and his daughter has Down syndrome. And he said, oh my goodness, my daughter has lost her glasses. She's lost her sunglasses. I have no idea what I'm going to do. She's lost her sunglasses and I can't find them everywhere. Like I've been looking for an hour and there's, I, I haven't been able to find them. And so I said, all right, all right, calm down, calm down. Like what color were her sunglasses? And he goes, they were orange. And at that point it hit me that we're not talking about a pair of Ray-Bans. We're talking about a pair of glasses. She, you know, possibly got at Walgreens or her dad got for her at Walgreens. So I said, I tell you what, you give me your name and address. And if I find those glasses, I will mail them to you. And like the look on his face was like, oh, thank you so much. That I, I don't know what I would have done. Uh, thank you so much. And I'll never forget like the look on his face and how just being there for his daughter was the most important thing on God's green earth to him. And so after the fair, like two days later, I went to Walgreens and bought like, and it only cost me less than 30 bucks, seven pairs of multicolored sunglasses and I mailed them to him. And I just wrote him a little note that said, we were unable to find your glasses. We hope that one of these will will help take their place. And we hope you had a wonderful time at the VP Fair, signed VP Fair Management. I didn't include my name and I didn't include my return address or my phone number. So I never heard from the dad. Um, and to be honest, it's not why I did it. In fact, I don't even think I knew why I did it at the time because I was really young. I was maybe like 22 or 23, but I know why I did it now. Imagine how it feels to get to be the person who renews someone's faith in humanity. I mean, was it altruistic? <clears throat> Absolutely. I wanted nothing in return from this man or his daughter, not even a thank you. But it doesn't mean that the byproduct of feeling good about yourself for being human is wrong. And I don't feel like I'm doing this to better your opinion of me. At this point, you either like me or you don't. And I'm good with that. What I do want to do, though, is to get you to, as Wayne did in the shoe store, to read the room. And with everyone you encounter, to treat them with compassion and kindness. Because deep down, you're not just writing your story. You're helping others write theirs. So what does this have to do with what you do at LC Enterprises? It has literally everything to do with what you do at LC Enterprises. When you're helping an organization or a company with marketing or branding or content or ads or blogs, you're not just relaying the who, the what, and the where of that company. You're in reality helping others tell their story, their how, and especially their why. So within a 10 minute drive of my house, there are over 60 places where I can get an oil change. And yet I always go to the same Meineke on Manchester Road, even though they're closed on Saturdays and Sundays. And why? Because they take care of me. They're honest and they have personal relationships with everyone they take care of, me included. The guy who runs the place, his name is Patrick. And I know about his kids and he's got twins and he's making those twins share a car. I feel for those twins. I mean, I like to go back to one of the most poignant things I've ever read. It's from Maya Angelou. And I want to make sure I get this right. Um, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. So when I do video work for companies to tell the public what they do, the first question I always ask is, what's your why? 
Tell me why you love to do what you do, what wakes you up in the morning, what it means to you to be able to make a difference in the life of someone else. And it's so funny. They're always taken aback by that. But then when we get into their why, it almost becomes like a therapy session. Like folks remember like why they got into their profession in the first place. One of the loveliest ever was a mortgage broker, which sounds on paper as exciting as watching paint dry. But when I, when I asked him this, and after thinking about it for a minute or two, the broker said, I do it for the joy on people's faces, you know, when they buy their first house. Sometimes they cry. A lot of times they're scared. But knowing that I walk through this with them makes me feel like I'm making a difference in the world. Now, tell me you would not want that person as your mortgage broker. Simon Sinek once said, stories are more powerful than statistics. I mean, just say this mortgage broker could tell you, I've helped over 2,000 families buy their first house. It's a great number. It's an impressive number. And it means absolutely nothing to you emotionally. But what if that same mortgage broker told you this? Sometimes you get to help folks on their last house too. An older gentleman lost his wife and their two-story was more than he could handle by himself. So together with his real estate agent, agent we helped him get ready to sell his house. Um, we found a little bungalow for him that was more appropriate of his size. And we even helped him unpack some of his boxes on the day he moved in because on what could have been one of the loneliest days of his life, we wanted to let him know that he was not alone in the world. For the last year, we've had a standing lunch date on the first Friday of every month, and he still won't let me pay. That's what you're helping companies do. That's why it's so important that you know that you're not just helping them sell a product. You're helping them to be introduced to a wider world that they have yet to meet. And what better way to do that than to help them tell their story? So with that, I'm going to ask you just a few questions about the very, I know I've thrown a lot at you, um, but I'm going to ask you a few questions. Just shout out the answers if you know them. Um, so question number one, what kind of dress and what kind of veil did Stephanie wear? Communion veil confirmation dress. Where did we buy the shoes? Kmart. Kmart. Bonus points. How much were they? Nine ninety nine. Thank you very much. Um, why was it? I shopped at Kmart. Why was there a good chance that we are we're not going to be able to meet the Pope? Very too long. Very very long. long. What did we buy our nieces when we got to St. Peter Square? Do you remember? Rosary. Very good. Okay, how many languages does the Pope give his speech in? Five. What was remarkable about the Pope's hands? They were so smooth. Manicured at least every day. No <laughs> fingers. <laughs> and finally, where did where did we eat when we left? McDonald's. So I may have repeated a couple of things in that story, but I told it one time and I told it about 20 minutes ago and you guys had no issue whatsoever remembering some pretty fine details about it. So congratulations to you. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I will open it up. If you have any questions, comments, I'm happy to answer anything. Thanks. No, the only comment I have, Christy, is I would love for you to search on YouTube real quick and find the Storage Wars Wayne Elsie video. Sure. And for Dan, because that's a classic. Oh my God. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Oh, Dan, I wanted to clarify this is um, Fun Storage, our fundraising company. Absolutely. So, and I think that even goes even further. Um, so with funds to orgs, um, I've been collecting shoes for ever since Wayne started. And so far, what's been amazing is that we have collected over 250,000 pairs of shoes and they have gone to micro enterprise in Haiti and other countries it's helped to raise money, not only for um, the uh, uh, the little 
not-for-profit that I run, the Half Fund, but I've also told others about it. In fact, this year, my son's uh, high school, which is a Jesuit high school, um, ended up having a uh, they ended up having a shoe drive. Uh, literally, oh my God, there it is. <laughs> we we ended up having a shoe drive right um, uh, right after Christmas, and it raised a thousand dollars, and that thousand dollars goes towards scholarship aid for people. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important. I think it's important that um, a lot of times, I'll never forget this, when we partner with the American Cancer Society um, locally here, the problem that they said that they were having was that they were honestly like a legacy, stuffy um, uh, organization that didn't have a face. And so one of the things that that I've learned is that once you can put a face to a need, um, it, it's really amazing what people will do to, to help that need. Um, and I think like with funds to orgs, uh, like with us, especially people know that any time of the year on every day of the week, they can run by our house and drop shoes off and know they're going to go to help someone in need. Um, and it's a great thing. Like in, in fact, I get, I get calls every week. Do you still have the box on your front porch? Absolutely. We will always have the box on our front porch. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this is a storage locker right here. In a moment, I'm going to saw off that lock. When I saw off that lock, you can look and only touch, cannot touch, only look. You cannot touch, only look at the contents inside, cash only. Pay the lady right over here. All right. There it is. All right, we're going to start bidding $300 out here. $300, $300 right over there for Wayne. $300. Yep, pay it, Dave, with $350. Who's going to give me $400? $400, yeah, $400 right over here. Who's going to give me $4.5? Four Four and a half right over here, four, four and a half right over there. Who's gonna be five? Five hundred dollars for five hundred dollars, five hundred dollars bid. Five hundred dollars right over there. We're six hundred dollars bid now. Six hundred dollars bid, who's gonna give me six hundred dollars bid? Six hundred dollars bid hip. Six hundred dollars, six hundred dollars, six hundred dollars. Six hundred dollars going once, six hundred dollars going twice. Oh, Dave with the six hundred dollar bid right over there now. Hip, 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 h
And the first time I actually put picture and sound together, that was it. I, I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. So um, I worked for five and a half years on Stephen DC. And then I ended up going and studied, uh, I studied film and video at the Vancouver Film School in 1999. I graduated in 2000 and I've been doing film and video ever since. Our very first commercial for Funds to Orange was done mm -hmm. by Dan. Mm -hmm. It played on our website forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was fun. Now, somewhere. Yeah. So you'll recognize we still, we still owe him for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> we'll make you dinner, Dan. <laughs> oh, Dan, tell the story about dinner. Oh, <laughs> Must you? Yeah. Well, you right. tell, I don't want to tell my version. Okay, so um, it was very, very nice. Um, we went down to Florida for vacation and, um, and Wayne actually put us up, which was just super nice of him. And I'm like, you know what? We'd like to make you dinner. And so what we did was we actually went over to Wayne's house, probably like around seven o'clock. Um, and we were done with dinner by about midnight because we got to talking and we were, you know, I'd make one course and then like we'd eat that and then I'd make another and then we'd eat that and everything was kind of just separate. So um, it was well after midnight by the time we left. So dinner took a while. <laughs> yeah, that's a short version. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, Sammy's like, we're going to have dessert at breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Good times. Good times. Nice seeing you, buddy, man. We love you. We love you, guys. Uh, I love you guys too. Thanks for having me. Yeah.